Clarence Thomas, yeah. you're the best man walking the face of the earth. It's an honor to interview <laughs> you for my leader series. Thanks for agreeing to do this. Happy 2018. Well, I'm really stressed out about this interview. <laughs> I just want to say, you know that your wingspan has always amazed me, that you've come from poverty in Georgia. You've been a left-wing radical before you've had and now you've seen a whole different side of life talk about lessons learned from your wingspan I think you learn that life can be very humbling that you think you know at 18 or 19 all the answers and then you realize that they lead to a lot of questions my grandfather always understood that he would um, when I would come home full of answers, he would ask you, and then what questions? So after you destroy this country, where would you go? Which country? And what would your country look like? And to which, of course, when you're a kid, you have no answers, as most kids don't. And um, so I think humility, um, I think patience, uh, persistence. Uh, there's lessons about people you meet along the way. You know, my grandfather would have all these sayings, and I think one of the reasons I wind up quoting him and my grandmother and the people around me and much of sort of the cultural uh, attitudes or aphorisms that uh, you heard was because that's the way you learned how, you, how to live your life. So one of the things that he would say is the Lord helps those who help themselves. Uh, as far as cooperation with other people, he would often say, son, it takes one hand to wash the other. That you have to figure out a way to work with someone else. I think one of the things that happens is when you go from one place to another, almost uh, a nomadic experience, you learn how to figure out what you have in common with other people. So I think that was kind of important. That it was a lesson that no matter who it is, what station in life they're at, you can find something that you have in common. Even if it's just a football team, it could be um, um, an experience, it could be a, a sort of a hobby, it could be just an observation, it could be bigger things like religion or philosophy. But you can find something. And the other thing, I think, is to see that everyone has um, value, inherent value, and they have had experiences that are worth uh, listening to. You know, when you look at why you're still here or how you managed to survive, it's beyond me. I mean, certainly it would be my miracle after miracle after miracle. You know, it's always interesting to me when people say, well, I don't believe in miracle. Well, I have no other explanations. Uh, it doesn't add up. Uh, you can say it's luck. You can say it's good fortune. You could say, you know, I prefer to just say, well, it's just divine providence. That Because there is just no explanation that one, that a house burns down, that winds it results in my brother and me going to live with my mother in this tenement. Well, then she can't really handle two little boys and working for 10 to $15 a week. So she takes us to our grandparents. And then so you wind up being raised by two of the greatest people you would ever know. Tell me that's not miraculous. They then take you to a Catholic school where you have nuns who devote their lives to little black kids in the inner city of Savannah. So then that is another miracle. You then wind up going into the seminary, and that's another totally different experience. Now, how do you explain all of that? I mean, how does it all sort of make sense if you look at it as you go through it? In retrospect, it makes sense. But to me, looking at it, retrospectively also suggests to me that it is certainly providential that this happened. I see you pull out the litany of humility all the time. What's that do for you? Oh, 
it, it focuses you because it tells you not to focus on whether you're praised or criticized, to not worry about whether someone gets more than you get, to not worry about um, whether someone is going to say something hateful about you, whether they're going to uh, calumniate you. Don't, don't worry about whether or not they say good things about you, that it doesn't matter. What really matters is whether or not you do what you are called to do. A young man asked me, what role does ambition play in your career and in your life? And I thought about it. I had never been asked that. And I said, oddly, I don't have anything against ambition, but oddly, it's never played any role in my life. The, when you are, think you're called to the priesthood, as I thought I was in 1964, um, you, and then I didn't go become a priest. I didn't think I had a vocation, but you're always looking for the next calling, the next vocation. And so this, to, to live up to that, that vocation and that calling, you have to discard these distractions of praise, of, of being afraid, of being criticized, of wanting to be first, of wanting to be uh, treated well and feeded and all those sorts of things, because none of that has anything to do with being called to do what you're called to do. I'm called to do a job. Whether you're criticized or praised has nothing to do with that. Someone asked me recently, some years ago, remember now I'd been away from the church for 25 years. I left in a huff in 1968. And Someone said, why did you go back? And I said, life. <laughs> life happened. Things happened that you can't explain. And the, then you realize there's only, there was only one place to go. And for me, that was back before the Blessed Sacrament. So the, you know, the others criticize it, but so be it. It's as Mother Teresa said, it was between... It's always between God and me. But faith is, I think it's important to keep you, uh, give me the strength to do what I have to do every day, to, to assert the independence, to be willing to take the beatings, uh, the criticism, the, you know, the unfairness. That's a part that comes with the turf. But faith allows you. With God, you can do that. It also gives you the wisdom, the insights, the capacity to do the work, to decide these things, the discipline. Um, it gives content and meaning to the oath I took. At the end of my oath, and for this job I had to take two, you say, so help me God. It's an oath to God. So... If you have a strong faith in God, then that oath gains in meaning and content. So when you violate that, you're not violating a contract or a mere promise, but an oath to God. So the faith, I, you know, I go to mass before, I, you know, I go to work. And the reason for that is not just habit. It's... It, it gives you a centering. It gives you sort of starts you in a way of doing this job, secular job, the right way for the right reasons. And it has nothing to do with what is said about me or what's written. But this is what I took an oath to do. So reflecting on your whole life at 69, um, what are the blessings that come to mind as you start 2018? Certainly uh, being born in this country. Um, the, I just don't see it happening anyplace else. Uh, one of the things, you remember when I was going up to Kennebunkport uh, in 1991, and you said you should have a speech to prepare in case you're nominated. And, of course, I resisted that, but I wrote, you know, some remarks, so I didn't look completely um, unprepared. But in any case, you added 
one phrase, only in America. And that's true, that captures it. So the other thing was, I would say, faith, um, the, the, I, which I inherited from my grandparents um, and my nuns. Um, the, um, the, the good people that I've met along the way, I'm mean, looking at the early part of my life, you know, you, whether it's the nuns or my teachers or the priests. And then later on in life, certainly as I got older, I would say Jamal. Um, and then the bigger part, larger part of my life is when we met, 1986. Um, and then married a year later, and it's been, you know, over three decades, and it's been a bit of a hoot. But you just think of the ride that we've been on, you know. So, and then all the good people I've met along the way in different capacities, whether it's Tom Soul or Jay Parker or whether it's Jack Danforth, my friends in the Attorney General's office. I mean, there's so many people that are just countless blessings. And as I look at my life, um, the the innumerable things that have happened that have been just good. Uh, you know, you, were, you asked me something recently, or you read me something about the dot on the piece of paper and the kids in the classroom, the, pa the paper that the professor handed out, and the kids all focused on the dot. And the professor then says, that's the, that, that's the tendency of people to focus on the one little thing and not all the space around the dot. And I think sometimes we do that, but there's it's been so much good space around the dots in my life. Uh, but people love to define, say, what happens because you're black, because I'm black, and because we're in this, in, in a country that, may, that has had racial issues. They want to define you by those dots when there's so many other positive things uh, that, that have happened. I have some things that are important. The, uh, your mother was a, not a sports fan, but she and your father were passionate Nebraska fans. And I think the, I saw something there that I liked. And I also liked the way they do things. I like the fact that there are things that you work toward that you believe in. I like to see there was a young woman at the University of Nebraska who transferred from LSU on the volleyball team, Brianna Holman, who was the first in her family to get a college degree. And she graduated the same day they won the national championship in volleyball. That is a big deal in Nebraska, and I love that. Uh, I love the fact that there's this idea that you do things the right way. So I, the, And I think I got that, that focus from watching your mother and then watching Tom Osborne and watching uh, the Huskers over the years. It doesn't matter which team, bowling. Uh, my favorite now is volleyball. I really like that. I just think they're fabulous. The, but there's other th things. Motorhoming was just, again, the good people you meet. You know, I just happened to meet a man, uh, who wonderful man, who said the best people in the country are in the RV park to which I, I was quite dismissive. And he was right, that was almost, that was over 20 years ago. And we have been motorhoming now 18 years, or at least we've had the same coach. So think of what we've seen, think of the parts of the country we've seen, think of the people we've seen, think of the, 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 the sort of fly over country that we've been through and enjoyed and experienced. So I think all of that informs sort of what I do and the way I look at things. Reading. Reading is a blessing. Um, when you grow up around people who are illiterate, you see that they're incarcerated by the inability to decipher things. They are trapped in this world where they're blind in certain ways and or as they would say in some of the more older language, insensate. So the, uh, or in, I think the other word would be insensible, but 
In any case, they can't experience lots of things because they can't decipher the words. You know, I'm watching people. I grew up around so much illiteracy that people would look at a piece of paper and they would ask you this question. Still sort of haunts me when I see people refusing to read when they can. What does paper say? You know, I mean, whether it's from my mother or whether it's from Cousin Hattie or Daddy or Antini, what does paper say? Or some books show up the other day. Um, then you finally, the nuns, and through school, you, you, it was very difficult for me to, to learn English. So the, and you asked me some years ago, I think it was last year, uh, you said, when did you finally become comfortable with the English language? And I told you in the late 1980s, and you said, oh, around the time we met. And I hadn't put the two together, but that was true. So I think reading is more than sort of, I wouldn't characterize it as a hobby. It is truly a blessing. It was something that I prayed to God when I was a kid that I would want, that I would enjoy that I would want to learn how to, to read, that I would want to read many books. And when I finally got that gift, it's sort of like, wow, it's like Christmas every day, every book. You know, I, did the, I, know, you, I know you think I'm a little different, but, and I am, but just think of this. I mean, you get to read Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson. Now, Many people would kind of roll their eyes <laughs> at <laughs> Boswell's life of Samuel Johnson. But just think of all the people who were around him, whether it was Edmund Burke or Adam Smith. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you want to read Boswell's life of Samuel Johnson? <laughs> I'll put it on my list, Justice. I'll lend you my copy. As long as you underline it for me. Okay. What about what about Wealth of Nations? Just underline these things for me. I have a life to live. <laughs> Thank you for your reading. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, God, you make me laugh. <laughs> um, if someone asks you for advice when they're getting married, what do you suggest? Generically, I'd say you're marrying an adult. You're not raising somebody. That the person you married is an adult. And then I keep a sign on my desk. Don't make fun of your wife's choices. You were one of them. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. And that's so true. Okay, what do you what do you say? Because I love my wife, so my wife cries me. And I think you learn how to enjoy each other's company. And you're two different human beings who come together to form one. And you and I are very different. I mean, you don't read the life of Samuel Johnson. <laughs> Exactly, exactly right. Oh, God, I love you. <laughs> Thank you, honey. What do you tell people about interracial marriage? It's not something that either of us looked for when we started, but what do you say? I just don't think of it. The only time it ever came up really was really doing the confirmation stuff when we were being attacked. And I was, you know, if, I'm, if I were more progressive or liberal, it would be considered progressive to be in an interracial marriage. But if you are not, then you are selling out. So I mean, that's, it's just one more way to attack or to criticize for some people. But, you know, I don't really get caught up with a lot of that. I don't think of it as some statement. You're my wife. That's it. When I was mentoring this 13-year-old in D.C., I told you this. 
one, this little girl said, I don't know what the controversy is about interracial <laughs> marriage because you fall in love with their insides anyway. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. That's consistent with the way we were raised uh, with my grandfather, uh, that you were required to look at character because there was so much under segregation. There were these rules based on skin color and there were even intra-racially among blacks, there were gradations of skin color. And of course, because we were more Negroid in our features and dark, we were certainly at the bottom of that pecking order. So it, the nuns and my grandparents would often talk about, we're all the same in God's eyes. And so you didn't, you were required to focus more on what we would later go on and focus on legally, a colorblind constitution. We, would have, we were required in our individual or our daily dealings to also be colorblind. Okay, so ritual defamation has been defined as retaliation for the real or imagined attitude, opinions, or beliefs of the victim with the intention of silencing or neutralizing his or her influence and or making an example out of them so as to discourage similar independence and insensitivity or non-observance of taboos. With such a big divide between those who know you, the reality of Clarence Thomas, and the myth that some propagandists make about you, um, what are the lessons learned for those who are feeling as if they're in the midst of ritual defamation themselves? You know, <clears throat> again, I go back to the, a touchstone, the touchstone in my life, my grandfather. Uh, when I called him and I asked a similar question um, in the early 1980s, um, that, you know, I was getting beat up pretty good and this was all new to me, and I asked him, what should I do? And he, his advice was just very straightforward. Boy, you have to stand up for what you believe in. And so, that sounds simplistic or simple, but it's just hard. <laughs> and that's why people don't want to do it. They don't want to take the beatings. And those who administer the beatings understand that. But I think if you go back, I think in my book I quoted Richard Wright, um, where he said that the worst I've ever been treated is when I've told the truth. And that's the way it works. And one of my fears when I was a young man in, uh, at Monsanto uh, about my views becoming public uh, was that I would be beaten or ostracized or criticized. Well, the beating started immediately in 1980 and have continued, so it's just a way of life. But there's also the other side of it, to be able to know that you have done what you are required to do, that you have been truthful, that you have not deceived people, that you can put your head on your pillow and sleep soundly. My grandfather always talked about the, 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 the sort of peace that you had when you did what was right. And so there's nothing that the, the critics can either give me or take away that's of value to me. They can't take away sort of what I think about what I do because they have no input into that. Um, one of my clerks said something to me years ago that I will never forget. Um, I was being less than charitable to someone who, or an organization or an institution that had done some negative things to me. And I was very content to be uh, negative toward them in my attitude. And she said, why would you allow them to make you someone you're not? So you, you, when you overreact or react negatively to what others do to you, you've given them control over defining who you are now. Before that, all they got to define is what they said about you and what those they control or persuaded thought about you. But they never got to control who you were. But when you react in a negative way 
to those things, you have indirectly allowed them to control you and define you. But I do ask this question of young, particularly young minorities in the, um, um, when I see them at the court or in, in various other places, particularly universities, what is it that they don't want them to hear? Why, what is so threatening? I spend hours with them, these kids. I sit in the room with them, let them ask whatever questions they want. And then I ask them, now what did I say that is so dangerous? And of course there, there's no answer. But what is it that they don't want them to, do, to, to learn? You know, back when I was in school, they often spoke, particularly among those on the hard left, the... Uh, that blacks would be the vanguard of the revolution. Uh, the, the, their words, the vanguard. And I would cynically say sometimes that meant you would be the grunts in their ground war and you'd be the first to go. My interest is in that kid having a chance, that that kid learning how to read or have a positive attitude or being able to do things, and I'm, they're not a, a pawn in any game. They're not a part of, they're not the vanguard. They are human beings. So what is it they don't want that kid to hear that, is, that I'm saying that's so dangerous? Kids, kids are great, by the way. I mean, I have not, I think students are great. I think that they're just kids. Um, but the one kid um, in our discussions, um, you know, were concerned about, you know, the, I think they bought into the myths. And, but after you spend time with them, they, they change their attitudes. And I said in our discussions to them, like, okay, let's just take the things that they've said about me. I said that, have you in your life done what I've done? Have you sort of achieved the things that I've achieved? And they, of course, say no. And I said, you're just beginning, you're a kid. But think about it. If they can denigrate the sort of all the things that I've done, undermine it, devalue it, discount it, if that's what they think of me and I've done all these things, what do you think they think of you? And the kid stopped the minute and said, oh my goodness, that by that logic, I'm nothing. They think in extremely little of me, or so if they can reduce the great quantity that you have, then what the little that I have is eviscerated. So I think that they begin to understand when you put it in that context that, look, it is to their advantage, it's to their credit, it's for their uh, own sake that they should not buy into these myths because I'm sort of the first, but down the line they'll be uh, included. So last night, as I was thinking about this, I rewatched your 1998 speech to the National Bar I've Association. I've never rewatched that, by the way. You did it. <laughs> And it was in Memphis. That was and it 1998? Was, it was remarkable. And here's the ending of it. I have come here today not in anger or to anger, though my mere presence has been sufficient, obviously, to anger some. Nor have I come to defend my views, but rather to assert my right to think for myself, to refuse to have my ideas assigned to me as though I was an intellectual slave because I'm black. I, can't, I come to state that I'm a man, free to think for myself and do as I please. I've come to assert that I am a judge and I will not be consigned to the unquestioned opinions of others. But even more than that, I have come to say that isn't it time to move on? Isn't it time to realize that being angry with me solves no problems? Isn't it time to acknowledge that the problem of race has defied simple solutions and that not one of us... Not a single one of us can lay claim to the solution. Isn't it time that we respect ourselves and, our, and each other as we have demanded respect from others? 
isn't it time to ignore those whose sole occupation is sowing seeds of discord and animus? Isn't it time to continue diligently to search for lasting solutions? I believe that that time has come today. Thoughts on doing that, saying those words, doing that speech to that group? Well, that group was contrary to much of the press coverage. And of course, that's almost two decades ago now. They were just delightful to be around. Of course, there was some tension, but that was not the bulk of the people there. Uh, most people are very positive and hopeful and don't quite understand what is going on because they, they're busy with their lives. But I wrote that speech because I thought it was important for someone to assert the right to, particularly among blacks, the right to think for themselves, the right to be that invisible man, to, to be the one who lays claim to his own thoughts. I mean, think about it today. The, what if, for example, that they, someone said just very clearly that certain opinions were off limits to all blacks? No blacks need uh, think this way. No black thinks. They say it every day that a black person can't have this set of ideas. Or go back to ritual, def, ritual uh, defamations. Um, if you have a certain set of ideas, you're punished for them. So in a sense, they're saying that every day. And I think it's important that when that happens, on behalf of all the people who've come before, people like my grandfather, people uh, who fought to end those sorts of things, to assert and be willing to take the beating for asserting that we have a right to think for ourselves. Also, I have an obligation because I am a judge, I'm an Article Three judge, that as a judge, you don't get to be on one team or the other. You have to think uh, independently in order to live up to the oath that you take. And the best part of being a justice? It's, first of all, it's, um, it'd be impossible without you. I'm, I have to be honest, I mean, it would be, um, it's sort of like, how do you run with one leg? You can't. I mean, the, um, it makes it whole when I have my wife. Um, the best part of the job itself would be hanging out with my law clerks. Uh, the, they're energetic. They're fun. I've had over 100. They're smart. They're hardworking. They're dedicated. And I make them a promise that they will leave this job with clean hands, uh, clean hearts, and clear consciences. So there'll be nothing they'll have to hide, or they'll have to keep confidences, but not little secrets. And it has been just a delight to, to, to have these kids. But that would be the best part. I like my colleagues. I miss my Colleagues who've either passed away and those who've retired. Uh, I miss the court that was together for over a decade. Um, I regret not having spent more time with people like Byron White. So, I mean, there's so much. I mean, there's, it's been, um, I mean, this is my 27th term. So it's been a lot of friends, a lot of good people, a lot of great law clerks, a lot of wonderful experiences. When you select law clerks, one thing you do look for is that character. You're looking for that work ethic, the intellectual honesty. You're looking for the honesty. You're looking for, uh, and of course, I prefer people from more modest circumstances. I like kids from state schools. I like kids from, um, I've, they're fine from the Ivy. I like those too, but I like kids also, a lot of them from the non-Ivy League schools. Okay, we're done. Thank you. I had more stuff to say. <laughs> How long did we go? We went like, oh. um, actually, I'm not sure. I think 40 at least. Yeah. yeah. I have more stuff to talk about. Do you, do, do you have questions for me? Yeah. 
I, let me see. What did I do with my list of questions? He's taking oh, did you want me to leave it off? No. I, oh, okay. <laughs> I do have some questions. <laughs>